All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We are so grateful that you have joined us for our Building Strong Brains Tennessee Learning Collaborative um, webinar series. Today, we have Child Trends. We are so excited that they are here. If you're unfamiliar with Child Trends, they are the nation's leading nonprofit research organization focused exclusively on improving the lives and prospects of children, youth, and their families. They do that by conducting high-quality research and sharing the, the resulting knowledge with practitioners and policymakers. For 39 years, decision makers have relied on their rigorous research, unbiased analysis, and clear communications to improve public policies and interventions that serve children and families. They are so respected, and we are grateful that they are here with us today to share information about one of their newest reports that focuses on um, the whole child and, and, and improving school policy um, to, to create better outcomes for children and improve school culture. So with that being said, um, I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Deborah Temkin, who is the Senior Director uh, for Education Research, and then Dr. Kristen Harper, who is the Director for Policy Development. Later in this uh, presentation, we will have uh, Lori Paisley join us, who is the Executive Director for Healthy Schools for the Tennessee Department of Education, and she'll be able to put a lot of this um, work in context for us with regard to what um, TDOE is doing to advance uh, the vision that uh, Child Trends has set forth for us and to give us a little bit of history. Um, just as a reminder, all of you are on mute, and we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll have um, Child Trends present for about 40 minutes, then Lori will have approximately 10 minutes, um, and then we'll have 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, all of those Q&As, I'll read them aloud for those of you who are joining us on the phone from the chat box. And then one other reminder, um, this is being recorded, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and disseminated pretty widely. So I just want to let you all know that um, whenever you're you're asking questions that this will be available for public consumption. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to our presenters with Child Trends to do a little bit of a deeper introduction of their work and what they do and to kick us off. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, this is Deborah Temkin. And, and as was mentioned, I am the Senior Director of Education Research here at Child Trends. Child Trends does work um, across all areas of child development, um, focusing on improving um, outcomes for youth through rigorous research. Um, and we are really thrilled to be um, involved in a project that's funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called Together for Healthy and Successful Students, which is where this project falls under. Um, and our mission really is to understand how states are really going about um, school health within their policy landscape, um, and also to identify where there are opportunities uh, to actually help states grow their efforts around school health. Um, and we ground all of our work within the whole school, whole community, and whole child framework. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the WSCC, as I will uh, abbreviate this throughout the presentation, this is a framework that was developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and ASCD in 2015. It's grown uh, grew out of the coordinated school health model, but um, expanded it to really encompass all of the uh, factors that contribute to a child's healthy uh, development, both academically, socially, emotionally, and physically. What you see in this model is that there are 10 domains that all contribute to a child being healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. You'll see that these encompass both what we traditionally think of as school health, including health education, physical education, nutrition, health services, and things that have been uh, traditionally considered separately, things like mental health support, social emotional climate, and also things like the physical environment around a student, things like the school facility, um, as well as employee wellness. The idea here is really that each of these uh, components work together to support a healthy child, and also that each of these components are dependent on each other. And this is a really important point uh, because what we've seen in the past several years is that there have been lots of initiatives around school health at the national level. Um, some of these things that we've seen, um, for instance, under the Healthy and Hunger-Free Kids Act, we've seen a real expansion 
in uh, states' focus and schools' focus on student nutrition and local wellness policies. We saw during the last pre uh, presidential administration a real focus on physical activity through the former Force Ladies Let's Move initiative. We saw a great expansion in bullying prevention, both legislation as well as prevention programming in states and schools. Um, at the same time as we saw a great expansion in efforts to really rethink how we were approaching school discipline and move towards more supportive school discipline practices. We've also seen a movement towards social emotional learning, as well as a broader definition of what student success means under the Every Student Succeeds Act. Now, each of these uh, campaigns have really happened um, in isolation of each other. And a good example of this is the contradiction between some of the efforts around bullying and some of the efforts around support of school discipline. What we've seen in recent years is an increasing movement towards um, more strict discipline or even criminalization of bullying. At the same time as we're hearing the importance of uh, limiting the use of exclusionary discipline, um, both in terms of disparate uh, impact of exclusionary discipline, as well as the school to prison pipeline. Part of what we wanted to understand is exactly what are, what are the laws in each state that cover these issues um, and how are they working together. So this is what our project really aimed to cover. First, what is the current landscape of state policies related to the WSCC? Second, we wanted to understand from stakeholders, from educators, policymakers, and students, what the most pressing issues currently are around health and combined, take that information and provide some policy guidance on a key issue that's emerging now uh, to really expand the focus on the WSCC. So I am going to focus on the first of these questions, the current landscape of state policies, and focus a bit on Tennessee's policies in particular. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Kristen, to talk about um, the stakeholder research that we did, as well as the policy guidance. This is a report that we released in January um, that covers state policies according to the WSCC. And you can find it at the link, um, hyperlinked uh, at the bottom of the slide, and we'll make sure that that gets shared as well. But I'm going to walk you through some of the findings here. Our goal with this analysis was to look at all policies related to the WSCC across 50 states and the District of Columbia. Um, and we wanted to do that so in order to identify where there might be opportunities, both at a national level and in each individual state, for improving how states are thinking about the WSCC. A couple key points to remember about this report. One, um, all of the policies that we analyzed um, were policies that were enacted as of September 2018. Now, this is a really important state. Um, uh, excuse me, September 2017. This is a really important date in that um, we know that policies, including those in Tennessee, have been passed or enacted after the state. Um, so the data that you see here may not be as up to date as um, you know your state to have, but um, it's really important to have that basis of comparison in order to really understand that snapshot in time. In order to develop the coding rubric that we used for the policy analysis, we looked to other model policies that are out there and other coding schemes. So this includes some existing policy databases that are out there, as well as some of the documentation that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention put out, as well as ASCD. Again, we coded each policy um, policies across each of the 10 domains of the WSCC. So on this slide, you'll see that the number of topics in each domain varies um, and ranged from eight in employee wellness uh, to 22 in physical education and physical activity uh, and 27 in health services. After we completed our coding of state laws, we classified states based on their coverage of law. Now, let me stress, this is simply how many topics a state covers. It is not a reflection of how well a state covers these topics, nor whether these topics are integrated across states. We classified states into four categories, those with deep coverage, which meant that they comprehensively covered the topics in at least six of those 10 domains, 
broad coverage, which represented uh, comprehensive or moderate coverage in um, between four to eight of those uh, topics, more limited coverage, um, and weak coverage. And you'll notice here that Tennessee has deep coverage, meaning that in at least six categories, you have comprehensive coverage. I'm going to walk you through a couple of the domains more specifically so you can get a sense of how things vary. So you'll notice that several states have um, comprehensive coverage around counseling, psychological, and social services, but great variation across states. Within that topic, you can see great variation between um, specific topic areas. So for instance, every state has a policy related to school counseling certification. But at the time we collected these data, again, September 2017, only 11 states had policies mandating or suggesting that schools implement trauma-informed practices. You can see a similar pattern here in social and emotional climate. And again, great variation within the topics within social and emotional climate. So you can see, for instance, that 40 states either require or encourage positive behavioral supports, but only 18 uh, states have policies relating to dating violence. All of this information is captured within state-by-state -state briefs. Here we represent uh, the Tennessee brief, and you can see the link at the bottom of the slide where you can get the uh, actual brief. I will walk you through some of the findings just briefly. Um, for specifically around Tennessee. So here we can see the breakdown of the percentage of topics covered in each of the areas for Tennessee versus the nation. Now again, I wanna stress that what this represents is codified policy enacted as of September 2017. So you'll see that in terms of codified policy, Tennessee lags behind the nation to some extent in health education and physical education and physical activity, but is doing much better than some other states um, in the domains of social emotional climate, community involvement, and family engagement. You'll notice that Tennessee does not have any policies concerning employee wellness. Now let's walk through just a couple of these topic areas more specifically. So again, in physical education and physical activity, in terms of codified policy, you'll see that Tennessee does not address several of the topic areas that we identified. Um, for instance, it doesn't address um, physical education exemptions for disabilities, um, adaptive physical education requirements, but it does require that physical activity uh, occur throughout the day, which is a really important component of physical education and physical activity. In terms of social emotional climate, you can see that Tennessee has many policies that cover many of these topics. So for example, um, Tennessee requires social emotional learning or character development in schools. It requires uh, chronic absenteeism early warning systems that include comprehensive student supports. Um, and it uh, includes requirements around school resource officer training. Um, Tennessee, as with many states, as we saw in the overall, does not have a dating violence policy. Within counseling, psychological, and social services, you can see here, again, some of the distribution in uh, policies. I will highlight that we know that Tennessee passed a law on trauma um, in 2018. Um, but again, because these data were coded um, as of September 2017, this is not reflected. However, you can find the text of that legislation um, on the state policy database from the National Association of State Boards of Education. All of the data from our reports ended up on that website in a searchable way, and I'm gonna walk you through that um, in the next few slides. So this is the front page of the National Association of State Boards of Education State Policy Database on School Health. What you'll find there First is an interactive map that allows you to click through all of the topic areas that were included in our coding. And you can click through and generate a map to see just how states vary on each of those topic areas. You can also click through those uh, states to find the statutory and regulatory language for each of the topic areas. 
you can also find a listing of all policies related to school health for any given state. Here I've highlighted Tennessee's listing, um, which you can find through that database. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kristen, um, if I can figure out how to drop uh, the control, um, so she can walk you through our stakeholder uh, research as well as some of our policy guidance. Thank you so much, Deb. My name is Kristen Harper, and I am Director for Policy Development at Child Trends. I'm going to share our stakeholder engagement work and the policy guidance we developed after completing our state policy analysis and review of stakeholder perspectives. As we were gathering and analyzing state school health policies, we wanted to learn more about stakeholder perspectives of school health, uh, and we published last fall our findings after interviewing a series of individuals occupying different roles in education systems. So we spoke to a wide variety of policymakers across 15 different states, including state board of education members, state legislators, uh, legislative staff, uh, and other state administrators. We spoke with principals, teachers, school nurses, uh, school social workers, and we uh, engaged directly nearly 30 young people from across nine states uh, with support from National 4-H. And we wanted to learn how these uh, stakeholders defined school health and where they felt more support was needed to create healthy schools. So, uh, across the three sets of stakeholders, there were two reoccurring priorities. Uh, first were concerns about emotional and mental health. Stakeholders noted that schools are struggling to help students across socioeconomic levels with stress, anxiety, and trauma. Um, they wanted trained and qualified school personnel to support, school, support students uh, with their emotional and mental health needs. Uh, Educators and policymakers also saw social emotional skills uh, and skill development as a critical element to address student needs. They, they felt that uh, such skills might help students to better cope with their own mental health challenges, but also believed that they would contribute towards improvements in school climate and student relationships. Um, and apart from um, students' emotional and mental health, stakeholders also saw school climate and interpersonal relationships also as areas in need of more attention. So now, to be clear, the stakeholders we interviewed were concerned about multiple dimensions of health. However, as they were weighing priorities, it was clear that they felt school climate and mental health just hadn't been addressed adequately. We heard from educators that in most schools, issues like physical health uh, were already getting plenty of attention um, and were being addressed. So they really felt that there were sort of new priorities like um, mental health where um, just more attention was needed. Stakeholders also perceive mental health and social emotional skills as a foundation for other health priorities. So there was one teacher shown here uh, that spoke to the challenges that their students faced with depression and uh, felt that depression might be a barrier to helping students with other dimensions of health, such as um, health eating and physical activities. Uh, and then there were stakeholders uh, that also felt that social emotional skills and wellness uh, was really a strong cross-cutting issue that could help a state as a whole to promote prevention, support learning, and generally improve the healthy development of students. So now I'm going to shift a bit and talk about the policy guidance on trauma that we released at the end of January. So as I just said earlier, education stakeholders, including policymakers, have had a lot of concern about child mental health um, and about trauma. And at the same time, trauma-informed practices seems to be an area where there just wasn't a lot of policy content in place at the state level. And all of this is coming about at a time when tra trauma is high on people's minds due to natural disasters, research about adverse childhood experiences, school shootings, the opioid crisis, and, and other you know, issues and current events. Uh, so for this reason, we decided to build a uh, guidance document that illustrates how state-level 
education policies can help or hinder efforts to address child trauma in schools, um, illustrates the linkages between the many components of uh, the whole school, whole community, whole child framework, and the range of approaches needed to fully support children with a history of trauma. Uh, and perhaps uh, most importantly, uh, we wanted a guidance document that could offer a vision for creating supportive learning environments for all students. So I want to walk uh, quickly through how we constructed the guidance and what informed its development, and this is laid out in the guidance's background section. So to begin with, we wanted to offer a framework specifically designed to help state officials shift systems through policy. And by state officials, I mean governors, state board of education members, state legislators, and state superintendents of education. We also anchored this guidance in a whole school approach, and by that I mean this framework recognizes that we need to do more than simply connect individual children with services. Uh, we have to also ensure that the environments in which they learn are supportive of their learning. Uh, so while policy does need to address the, ability, the availability of services, it also needs to address school-wide culture, practices, norms, uh, and interpersonal relationships. We also anchored this guidance in a whole child approach, meaning schools need to consider the full range of child needs, uh, academic needs, social and emotional skills, uh, nutritional needs, mental health supports and services, and more. Uh, and the goals of this guidance mirror those in a body of work that offers a broad-based vision for equitable, more supportive learning environments. Uh, Three examples I would point the audience to are the Nation at Risk, nation at risk to a Nation at Hope recommendations, uh, the Leading for Equity framework from the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the 2011 School Discipline Consensus Report by the Council for State Government's Justice Center. So the body of the guidance presents seven principles for advancing policy change, and they're organized into three parts. Under part one, states uh, would build a statewide initiative to create supportive learning environments. Under part two, states review and revise existing state policy. And under part three, states support locally based school driven initiatives to create supportive learning environments. Now, before I dive into these, I do want to quickly note that this organization is not in any way intended to suggest that states follow a linear process. Um, we've simply presented the principles and the parts in this way so that they'd be easy to understand and recall. Uh, for states that have some activities in place, which is certainly the case for Tennessee, we hope that this tool could help uh, states to review and strengthen those activities uh, while helping the state to identify and attend to any gaps in the work. So let's dive in. Um, in the first part of the process, states, states launch a statewide initi initiative to create supportive learning environments. In this part, we have four principles that really speak to the state's capacity and foundation for supporting the work. Uh, and under the first principle, the state should have a clear vision written somewhere in some, in some form of policy. It could be in statute, it could be elsewhere. Uh, but that vision should explain um, how uh, the creation of supportive learning environments will promote both student health and student safety. Uh, however, this vision should also explicitly address trauma as part of an integrated effort to support, uh, to create supportive learning environments. Under Principle 2, states build a task force to educate state officials and the public on the implications of child trauma for teaching and learning uh, and to operationalize the vision from Principle 1. Now, here's a good example of what I mean when I say our framework isn't intended to reflect a linear process. Some states already have some kind of task force related to child health or safety or education equity. Um, or something similar. And in this case, the state could build a new task force based off of this framework or direct an existing task force to carry out the activities we lay out in this framework. Uh, for other states that have task forces explicitly devoted to supportive learning environments, uh, you might still have a context where there isn't a clearly articulated or shared vision for promoting student health and safety that directly addresses trauma. Regardless of where a state is, uh, we wanted with this principle to clarify that a standing 
multidisciplinary public-private task force is one of the foundational elements for carrying out the state's vision. This is how the state builds a high-level cross-agency understanding of trauma and its implications for the education system. Uh, this is how the state lifts up the voices of school communities in its decision-making and how it knows what capacity, infrastructure, workforce development is needed to carry out the vision. And it's this task force um, that keeps an eye on state policy and how policy serves to advance or inhibit the state's progress toward the vision. So um, while under principle two, state level personnel are working through the task force to build its awareness of trauma and its implications, principle three really speaks to the work the state does to increase awareness within schools and among school staff. This is the stage where the state investigates the workforce development and professional development opportunities available to increase the capacity and knowledge of educators and administrators. And under this principle, we highlight trauma, but also cultural competency and implicit bias as important areas where workforce development is necessary. And this is due to um, the reality of multi-generational and historical traumas experienced within different racial and ethnic and other subgroups. So uh, the last principle, principle four under this part, uh, looks at state capacity and expertise to help schools and school districts to create supportive learning environments. Um, and these will be, you know, pretty familiar. You know, has the state, you know, provided uh, technical assistance, um, you know, any sort of direct capacity either from the state or perhaps through a third party provider? Has it provided resources? Or, you know, are there grants? that can support this work in place? Um, is there guidance? Is there any, you know, are there any materials, uh, tools, or documents that help explain, like, the linkages between the work and any sort of existing regulations or state or other forms of state policy that are, that are already in existence? So that's part one, and we'll move on to part two. So in the second part of the process, uh, states begin to review and revise state policy, and there are um, two parts to this stage. First, under Principle 5, uh, states begin to investigate and address any policy barriers that could inhibit a student's access to services, um, but they also begin to look for ways to increase school capacity to provide uh, services um, and support. So uh, there are a number of areas where there's been, you know, some work aligned with this. Um, one example could be um, like school lunch access and a lot of the conversations taking place around uh, school lunch shaming. Um, uh, school use of Medicaid is another example that has been gaining more and more attention and the administrative barriers that might make it difficult for schools um, to, access, to access Medicaid. Um, but this is also the place where we look to uh, public-private partnerships um, at the local level or community-based partners that can help improve this improve a school's capacity to provide um, services and supports. Under Principle 6, states look for policy opportunities to address uh, practices and procedures that can traumatize or re-traumatize students. Uh, school discipline uh, is one example of an area where school practice can have heavy, heavy implications for traumatized children uh, that may have externalizing behaviors. So exclusionary practices such as suspension or expulsion can further alienate children who are already facing difficulties building strong and trusting relationships. Um, practices with a physical dimension, such as corporal punishment, uh, seclusion, and restraint, uh, could also risk further could also risk causing further trauma. However, under this principle, states would not only look for ways to minimize such practices and procedures, uh, but also support schools in replacing them. And we've we've seen many places um, where new state level policies have been introduced to shift practice on the ground. Uh, so in the last part of the process, we actually only have uh, one principle, Principle 7, which is focused on establishing funding mechanisms to support broad-based local action planning. Um, and in this, in, in this, in this piece, um, 
we, we really look at, you know, different ways that the state starts to rethink the support it provides to school districts and to schools. Uh, and the support can come in different forms, um, new grants, new technical assistance. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, a key aspect of this work involves shifting not only services, but the culture and norms of an entire school environment. So this means that educators and school communities really must be the drivers of the work. And the challenge uh, is uh, for states to identify strategies that give communities the time and the space to really rethink um, schools. Um, so like uh, principle two, where we were, I tried to highlight that as a foundational element, and there are a lot of questions that a state, you know, really need to consider. This is another space, another really foundational element, where there's just a lot of questions, you know, that need to be asked to figure out whether or not, you know, a state is really, you know, supporting this work on the ground. Now, um, that's, you know, the, the whole of the framework, um, but one last thing that I'll note is that we wanted this tool to be as clear and as actionable as possible. Uh, throughout the document for nearly all of the principles, we provide examples of uh, current state statute and regulation. Uh, these are meant to be illustrative and just help to ground the framework by presenting some of the work that has already taken place in many states. Uh, so we hope that this uh, suite of new tools and resources will be helpful to you in your work to create healthier, safer, more supportive learning spaces for all children. Um, Deb tried to provide, you know, throughout uh, links to the different resources, but all of them are available on the Child Trends website and really can be easily found simply by searching for using policy to create healthy schools. If you just uh, Google that, you should be able to find uh, most of the uh, resources that we've talked about today. Uh, so I just want to say uh, thank you so much for taking uh, time out of your busy day to hear about our work. You can reach either Deb or I at the two email addresses above. And with that, I'll turn things over to Lori Paisley to introduce herself and share more about Tennessee's work. Thank you so much. This is Lori Paisley. Um, Executive Director of the Healthy Schools Division here in Tennessee, and that includes coordinators for health and school nutrition. I appreciate the time to talk and appreciate what you guys have shared. Um, I've been a part of coordinated school health for quite a while. Hey, Lori, I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt. A, a couple folks are having a hard time hearing, so okay. if you might get closer to your uh, receiver or however you're, you're talking to us. Yeah, I've got my earbuds in, so I will pull it up to my mouth. That's much better. Thank you so much, thank Lori. You. No, thank you. Um, I'll just repeat that. I'm Lori Paisley, Executive Director of the Healthy Schools Division here in Tennessee at Tennessee Department of Education. The Healthy Schools Division includes coordinated school health and school nutrition. So I appreciate having the time to talk and appreciate what you guys have shared already. Um, real quickly, a little history about coordinated school health. Um, we've been doing this statewide for about 11 years and had 10 pilots prior to that. So we've been doing coordinated school health for quite a while. And, you know, due to that early adoption of coordinated school health here in our state, we have many policies that um, are, are very strong, but I really appreciate how you described, you know, the child trends report, um, and that today helped me to understand it a little bit better. But we've been working on some uh, pretty strong policies here for our state for quite a while with coordinated school health, not only being statewide in our state, but being in law and receiving state funding for 11 years. And that coordinated school health model does include the school counseling, psychological and social services component. And that component and that work has been assessed and evaluated through the school health index. So we've been doing that for quite a while. And um, a lot of the work that we've done across the state and the initiatives that have been developed address the needs of our students throughout the state. Uh, as you, you all talked about, some of the scores here um, as of September 2017, when I first saw this report, I was a little surprised at some of those, but it really gives me a, a good avenue to take 
to work on strengthening some of our policies. But again, we are in law in the coordinated school health model. And when WSCC framework came out, we are still in law under coordinated school health. So we have not officially moved to that framework. However, we do a lot of that work. Um, and, and ever since WCC, WSCC came out, we have been doing that work and really expanding on the social emotional climate is something that we have definitely done. Um, family engagement, we've strengthened a lot of that, but really the policy work and the, the state statutes and regulations as you described, um, it's really helpful to see this work and to see our state have such great information for strengthening, continuing to strengthen the, the policies here. One of the things I wanted to point out is that we give a lot of local discretion and we um, are here in the Office of Coordinated School Health to support and lead all of our school districts. We're very fortunate to have a Coordinated School Health Coordinator in each of our school districts across the state. And so they are in their school districts working on policies. So when I reviewed this report, although we may not have a particular policy in one area, we have school districts that we've been able to help develop and or strengthen policies in that area. So we're very fortunate to have a coordinator in every school district across the state. Uh, coordinated School Health at the state level has been an active member and partner of the Tennessee Aware, AWARE State Management Team. We've also shared AWARE resources with our coordinators across the state and really supported and helped that data collection through that strong statewide network of coordinated school health supervisors um, and directors. And so we're very proud of that partnership that we have and the work that we've been able to do. But on that note, um, just for everyone that's on the webinar, um, I just wanna encourage everybody to reach out and contact your school district's coordinated school health coordinator, um, partner with them. If you're not sure who that is, you can contact me or, or work through Jen, but um, it's pretty well known, but we still find some people that don't realize that in Tennessee, we have a coordinator in every school district. But I just wanna encourage everyone on the webinar to partner with those coordinators across the state in your local district. And that's really where we can get boots on the ground and everyone out in the field and the partners involved in expanding you know, school system policies and school policies and really any areas uh, that they feel need to be addressed um, where our students, staff, and families have needs. So that's all I have right now, unless there's any questions. Well, I'll go ahead and um, comment on a few things, Lori, uh, just for the folks that are participating. When I read this report, I was actually quite surprised at how high Tennessee ranked. Um, but then as I started getting into the various domains that they were um, analyzing or examining, I thought to myself, wow, um, we have had such immense leadership from our, um, from, from our folks at Department of Education and from school districts across the state who have really um, been invested in addressing a lot of these felt needs of, ch of children and families. And, um, and I really feel like that's reflected in this report. Um, I mean, when I think about coordinated school health, when I think about the project aware aware work, when I even think about the leadership that the Department of Education has um, done in uh, educating lots of school districts about building strong brains and trauma-informed school policies and practices, and most recently their work uh, to provide technical assistance to school districts um, to adopt trauma-informed policy and practice. It's pretty remarkable, and that is not every every state, right? That's not everywhere. Um, and so you all have created such fertile ground for for um, really good um, 
you know, school culture and um, child well-being that is, is going to translate to better child outcomes throughout our state. So I'm just so grateful for you, Lori. So with that being said, um, I think uh, those of you who may have joined a little bit later, I wanted to remind you all that you can ask questions in our chat box. And uh, I'll read them aloud for the folks that are on um, uh, on the telephone uh, that might not have access to a screen. So anybody who may have questions, please feel free to, to type them out now and we can have our series of panelists answer those questions. And while folks are, are typing in their questions, this is uh, Deb from Child Trends. Um, just just wanted to note a few reflections on some of the things that you pointed out, Lori um, and Jen. Um, it, just in terms of where where some of the limitations of our study are and things to think about. So um, as we pointed out in the slides, all we were able to do with this analysis is document the what of uh, what is in codified legislation or statutes and regulations, um, but not the, necessarily the how. Um, so we uh, don't know, for instance, how well these are being implemented in school districts or what school districts are doing that go beyond uh, the laws, as you pointed out, um, as well as how these laws are intersecting. Um, one of the things that we do in the report is we also look at um, topics across domains, so things like professional development. Um, and we know that in some states, uh, some states just in uh, the school health domains, not even including uh, academic subjects, they're requiring up to 11 different areas of professional development, which um, as someone who is engaged with quite a number of schools and know the struggles to even um, get, uh, you know, two days of professional development in, um, you know, that seems like an awful lot of topics if you're trying to do them independent of each other. So really trying to think about how these are integrated um, is really our next step um, in, in some of the work that we're doing here. Thank you so much for that clarification. That is really helpful. Um, and, you know, uh, I'll, another comment I'll make is we have seen just such um, just interest among educators across our state in um, adopting trauma-informed policies and practices and changing the way they do things. Um, and, and, and really we've seen an aha moment among a, a many educators as they've been able to understand, hey, what is the missing puzzle piece um, uh, when it comes to education and supporting um, child health and well-being and academic success? So I don't see uh, any additional questions being typed out. Now, you have um, everybody's email. Lori's email, if I'm not mistaken, Lori, correct me if I'm wrong, is lori.paisley at tn.gov. Um, and her name, okay, wonderful. And the correct spelling of her name is up on the screen. So if, you, if any of you want to reach out to, to one of these panelists directly, you can. Oh, I have a question. Wonderful. So this question is from Bernie Morris. It says, can you give some examples of how this is helping our children real life situations and not data only, please? So can somebody um, feel free, per perhaps one of the folks from Child Trends, talk about how the data or these school policies really translate into improving quality for children? Um, so I, I can tackle that. This is uh, Kristen. So I'll, I'll start by saying that we don't know how the products that we've built are helping children directly. We released them in, in uh, January. We're hoping that there be that they will directly trans in, translate into um, new policy, new policy approaches, and implementation that eventually um, help, helps children. But we don't yet know uh, to what extent the tools are being used, but I can give a real life um, situation that, that highlights the exact type of change we're hoping to create. Um, so this example was presented by uh, Judge Stephen Teske, um, who really was part of a, a, a turnaround strategy in Clayton County, Georgia. And he tells the story of a, 
of a girl in in a I believe she was either either in like late middle school or early high school. She gets up and she throws a chair across the back of the classroom, and he readily admits uh, that you know before they shifted you know their their strategy on school discipline and their relationship with law enforcement that this that this young woman uh, would have you know, had the police called and she probably would have been um, arrested uh, if not placed in the juvenile justice system. But because of their work to implement an inquiry-based process uh, to sit down with her and really sort of figuring out, you know, what's, what's going on, um, they learned that this was a child who had experienced a significant amount of trauma. Uh, she had been experienced for weeks uh, sexual assault at the hands of uh, her her mother's uh, you know, boyfriend, and by the end of the day, they were able to get this young person uh, services, uh, inst- and were able to uh, have the person that was assaulting her arrested. And this is an example. Not just you'll notice that in this story, it's not just the fact that the child you know, eventually get services, it's the school's entire orientation to the behavior. And this is a clear case where, you know, there was a tie between the young person's behavior and the trauma they had experienced. This was a very sudden event, you know, very um, out of character for this young person. Um, but that's exactly the type of shift in, 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 shift in culture and orientation towards, uh, towards, you know, the young people that are coming into the schools that we're hoping um, will happen through this, you know, Know, shift through you know shifts in policy and shifts in awareness at the state level and at the local level about trauma and its implications for teaching and learning. That was a beautiful example, and that's the whole reason why we're really focused on shifting policy here in Tennessee is because um, that's an example. Um, but then because of the policy shift, it's going to positively impact many, many other young people, just like the girl that you um, gave the example of here. Um, if there are any other questions, go ahead and type them in. And uh, I'll give folks maybe about one more minute because I haven't seen anybody else um, present or ask a question. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, Dr. Temkin and Dr. Harper and Lori Paisley, I just want to thank you all so much for your time today. We are really grateful um, that you are able to share with us, you know, uh, kind of a, a benchmark on how Tennessee is doing, uh, help us help validate that we're doing some things well, and also illustrate where we can make improvements to um, help mitigate uh, trauma early to and, and to support academic success and, and well-being for all children in our state. Um, so if you have any of the closing thoughts, please go ahead and say them. If not, we'll go ahead and wrap up our webinar. So I would just encourage folks to go and um, play with uh, some of the database, um, which is at statepolicies.nasbe.org um, slash help, and you'll find the data visualization there as well as all of the statutory and regulatory language. Um, if you have any questions, I'm always happy to respond by email. Um, and, you know, I just would love to also hear how you might be using the tools. As Kristen pointed out, these uh, were just released just a few months ago, and we are always eager to hear how they're useful and also um, think about ways we could improve them for their utility uh, as we move forward into potentially some next phases of this work. All right, wonderful. Well, with that, we'll wrap up. Thank you again for your time, and we will see you back here on this webinar next month. Bye-bye.